Our reading this morning is from Psalms, Psalm 100, which I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. A Psalm for giving thanks. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are the people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. It's the reading of the Lord. To discover a deeper understanding of what it means to truly worship the Lord, I would recommend to any person to read the entire book of Psalms. I know it's the longest book of the Bible, but it, it is so easy and enjoyable to read. You'll just fly through it. I'd recommend that you read some of it every Sunday morning before you come to church. And I know that if you would do so, you would be more prepared to worship. If I could pick out one psalm that would sum up what worship consists of, it would be this short and familiar 100th psalm. It's only five verses, but it speaks volumes about what it means to really worship the Lord. And it's my prayer that our time today may have a defined effect on how we spend our time in worship here at Spinning Road as we look at five different elements of true biblical worship. These are different components that make up for effective and meaningful worship. And so to help you remember them, I picked out words that start with the letter P. I don't know if that helps or not, but I hope it does. Uh, the first one is one you might have guessed, and that is the word praise. Now, by praise being an element of worship, I mean that praise is not just something that you do when you worship, but rather praise is the heart of what worship is. To worship God is to praise him, and to praise him is to worship him. Now, there's no one proper way to praise God. Different people praise God in different ways. Different churches praise him in different ways. Um, but one thing can be said for sure that, that we're off base if we think that to worship God, we must be quiet and still to know that he is God. Now, I know Psalm 46.10 says exactly that, and that's a very important verse to me, that, that, that Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There is certainly a time for us to do that, to be still and just acknowledge God for who he is. But you see, that verse is given to us so that we can see the contrast that is to the usual way of praising God. If you read through all the Psalms, you will get a new concept of what worshipful praise is all about. It's downright noisy. There, there's shouting and there's clapping and there's lots of musical instruments that are talked about in these Psalms of praise. As we see, verse one says, shout for joy to the Lord. Uh, most of us learn verse one of Psalm 100 as make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I've often heard that verse applied to people who can't sing well, saying to them, well, it doesn't say make beautiful music, it just says make a joyful noise. Well, that's a valid point, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, but that's not what this verse means. Derek Kidner, in his commentary on Psalms, says, this is not referring to the special contribution of the tone deaf. This verse isn't about singing. Now, verse two is, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but verse one isn't. Verse one is about making noise, about shouting. God wants to hear the sounds of the praising of his people, complete with claps and shouts and drums and cymbals and trumpets and tambourines or whatever instruments that we can get our hands on. Now, I know that there are, are certain practices within certain churches, and there are basic cultures about uh, how a particular church worships, and I'm not trying to change any of that. I'm not trying to tell you how to worship. I don't like when people tell me how I'm supposed to worship. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it hurts anything to let out an amen or a hallelujah or praise the Lord once in a while. And I love it when people do that. Doesn't mean we're turning into one of those churches that are people rolling on the floors or anything like that. So if you feel like saying amen, that's an encouragement to me. And uh, it's a show of support. But that's not the reason I want you to do it. I want you to do it because you can't help but do it. To shout for joy to the Lord, to give him honor, and glory and blessing. See, the basis of praise is that it's a voluntary thing, to do it solely because we want to, not because we're pressured to or because we're forced to or we're told how to do it. 
Uh, verse 2 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Or the NIV says, worship the Lord with gladness. Um, the, the reason the two words are used is because the Hebrew word abad could be translated either way, worship or service. And so we, we see then that those concepts of worship and service are actually inseparable. We usually think of them as being kind of different, don't we? We think of worship as when you bow your head and you pray and you, or you sing to the Lord. And, and we think of service as when you're actually doing something in, in service for the Lord. But actually, they're part of the same thing. When you're serving the Lord, when you're doing something, working in the church, helping other people, you are actually worshiping God. And, and when you're worshiping him, you're, you're praying quietly in church, you are serving him. This is your service to him. And so we should do so with gladness, voluntarily considering it a privilege and a pleasure and not just a duty and an obligation. And so while our praise needs to be voluntary, it is also something that we need to understand as being universal. We see this in that little phrase in verse one, all the earth or all ye lands. Um, usually the exhortation to worship and to praise is given to God's covenantal people. We read, praise the Lord in Zion, or shout, O Israel. And then we, in turn, apply that to the church of today, where, where God's people are told to praise him. But here in Psalm 100, the commandment is not even directed at God's people. It is for all the earth. And that's because praise is a universal thing. The word hallelujah is actually the same in every language. You can go anywhere in the world and say hallelujah, and they'll know what you're talking about. They'll know it means praise the Lord. It's the natural response of the created world to praise its creator. The Bible says in many places how creation speaks of the glory of God. And when it was attempted once to stop the multitudes from praising Jesus, Jesus said it couldn't be done. Even if he could, the rocks and the stones themselves would cry out to praise the Lord. That's because praise is universal. And one day it's going to happen. All the world will praise the Lord. Whether they trusted in Christ or not, every person will one day bow before him and confess that Jesus is Lord. Nothing can stop it because praise is universal. So the question is this. If even those who never knew Jesus will one day bow and praise before him, what is stopping us who love him and trust him from shouting to him in simple and humble praise? And it does require humility to praise. Um, it, it means I'm taking focus off myself and totally onto God. And so you might even feel like you're making a fool of yourself. But when there's true worship, then there is praise. And another element of worship is psalms. In other words, singing. But psalm starts with peace. So that's why I use that word. Verse 2 says, come before him with joyful songs. Or as I learned, come into his presence with singing. I've often wondered what people really think about the music in a worship service. We have a lot of music here in our service, if you, if you haven't noticed. I think that many people might look at it as some kind of you know, break in the service or to fill in some spaces between other things with some pretty songs or, or perhaps maybe some entertainment for the congregation or maybe some, it was a way to keep people interested with a special number or two. Or perhaps for some, it's just more of a tradition. You go to church and you sing songs. And that's why some, maybe particularly older people, prefer the old hymns that they grew up with and maybe not be so crazy about some of the more contemporary music or some of the, the newfangled praise songs. Maybe because that's what they're used to, it's their tradition. But there's nothing newfangled or nothing old fashioned about worshiping the Lord with a variety of music. In fact, we are commanded to do so. Ephesians 5.19 says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. The book of Psalms was just that. It was a collection of made up songs by David and, and others to express their worship to the Lord. And these Psalms were certainly different from what the people would have been used to in their tabernacle worship. And then the New Testament church made up their own songs, some of which are actually quoted in scripture as part of their worship. And even our old hymns were once newfangled songs that were made up by people who wanted a new way to worship God. Imagine back in the 1800s, there were some people in church saying, what's this amazing grace song everybody wants to sing? You know, what's, what's wrong with our old songs? But whatever kind of song it is, the important thing is that we sing it to God. God loves to hear us sing. Why is it? What is it about singing that's so important to worship? Why is it emphasized so much? Well, think about it. What is it that God wants the most from you? 
He wants your heart. And there's nothing like singing to stir the emotions that are within you. It's almost impossible to sing without feeling something. Lifting your voice, audibly expressing the written lyrics of a song, encourages you to think about why you've come to this place in the first place. Now, we all know that there are some whose relationship to the Lord is is totally dictated by their emotions, and that's certainly a dangerous thing to let happen. But how can you worship God without feeling something? Singing to God requires that emotion, even if it's only for a moment, even if it's only the slightest twinge of emotion. Refusing to sing will cut off that emotion that God desires for you to feel about him. And it really does have nothing to do with whether you're a good singer or not. Nothing does my heart more good or brings more joy to the Lord, I'm sure, than to hear someone who really can't sing just belt it out because he loves God and he wants to worship God. That's what worship is all about. So that's why we have hymns and choruses and songs and different styles of music. So if you can't sing, you don't like to sing, you don't need to sing in the choir or don't need to sing solos. In fact, we might prefer that you don't. (laughs) That may be more joy than any of us could handle. But... But if you do love to sing, there are so many different ways to express that. And uh, in, in fact, we need people to sing in our choir. We've been having a hard time getting enough people together to keep our choir going. So if you'd like to sing, see Susan about joining the choir. She'd love to have you. But whatever, whether you sing or like to sing or like music or don't like music, participate in worshiping the Lord with the music. Allow yourself to feel what it is that the music stirs inside of you, which is usually joyful and jubilant praise, but not always. Sometimes it's, it's sorrow and grief, or it might be conviction and repentance. That's okay. Just sing it out anyway. God's working on you. God wants your heart. So sing to him with psalms of worship. Don't just pass over the music part of the service as entertainment or something that some of the people like to do. Come into his presence with singing. Another element of biblical worship, which is, of course, obvious, but we must mention, is people. Verse 3 says, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. True worship requires that there be people. Now, we've all heard some say that they don't need to be in church to worship God. They can worship by themselves wherever they are, out in the field, out in the pasture with the other sheep, or uh, alone in their room, or up in the mountains, or out on the golf course. I think there are a lot of devoted people on Sunday mornings out at the Church of Fairways and Greens. I don't golf on Sunday mornings, but when I do go golfing, I often do hear the name of Jesus mentioned, although not in a very good way. But, you know, I don't really buy that about you can worship God anywhere, and so I don't need to go to church. Uh, Sure, yes, you can pray, you can sing to God by yourself, you can offer praise and thanks to God, and you can meditate on his word when there's nobody else around. In fact, I encourage you to do that whenever you can, whenever you're able to. But even though you can do that, we need to understand that worship is very much a public thing as much as it is private. Look through the Psalms and notice all the references to public worship, the congregation of the saints, the assembly of the upright, the presence of the multitudes. In verse 3, when it says, know that the Lord is God, that word know means more than just how we usually think of it, to understand something. It means to acknowledge or to confess. So acknowledge that the Lord is God. Jesus spoke the same thought when he said, whoever will acknowledge me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. I think it's possibly the most arrogant thing to imagine, to refuse to acknowledge the Lord in the presence of others. To say, well, I'm going to worship God where I want and when I want. The emphasis is not on God, it's on what I want and where I want. We are reminded here that it is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his flock, and we belong in his pasture. So when we get our eyes on God and get off this independent me kick that so many people have, then we will see where we need to be, worshiping God with his people whom he has made. The next element of worship is what I will call the pattern of worship. Now, by pattern, I don't mean that you have to follow the same pattern or do things the same way whenever you worship. Often we do follow a very similar pattern, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's also nothing wrong with shaking things up once in a while and doing things differently. But what I mean by pattern is that there are certain aspects to worship that should always be remembered and included. And in verse 4, you see the obvious things that are our 
to make up the content of our worship, that uh, we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Thanksgiving needs to be the central thought of, of all that we do in worship. Being thankful affects how you look at every situation. It determines what your attitude will be toward whatever it is that you do. And if you're thankful to God and his blessings, then that changes everything. So we are to come to worship with thanksgiving. And that certainly holds true for our worship. Come to worship being thankful. Express your thankfulness for those specific blessings that God has given you. Count them. Name them one by one, as the old song says. Worship isn't really worship without thanksgiving. And, of course, then there is praise. Not only is praise an element of worship, as I spent the first 10 minutes talking about, but it's also a part of the content of the pattern of worship. We need to praise God specifically. By that, I mean not just repeating praise the Lord or thank you, Jesus, a hundred times, as you might hear some people do, but, but we need to identify why God is worthy of our praise and our adoration. And again, look to the Psalms, uh, our guide to true worship, and see all the specific reasons that are given for praising the Lord. And we should do the same. We can never run out of reasons. As we're saying, there's 10,000 of them and many more, I'm sure. But even more than saying what the content of our pattern of worship should be, I see something even more significant in verse 4. Notice it says, enter his gates and his courts. Often we will invoke God to come into our presence when we worship, but that's not what worship is all about. Worship is coming into God's presence. It's us going to him, us going to his turf. In almost every other aspect of our relationship to the Lord, it's the other way around. It's God coming to us. It's God doing for us, God providing for us, God blessing us, God becoming man and dying for us, God taking the initiative to do what we are unable to do for ourselves. So our salvation depends on the initiative of God in our behalf. But worship, true worship, is us going to God. And that's why I believe that there is something so significant and meaningful about getting up and going to church on Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Wednesday night. It's, it's us going into his presence. Instead of saying, oh, I'm so busy, Lord, if you want me to worship, you're going to have to come to me like you do with everything else. We go to him. One thing I don't think I'll ever understand is how people can say they love the Lord and they love to worship him, but they can't take time out of their busy, busy schedules to just go worship the Lord. Now, of course, for some people and for all people at some time, it's physically impossible, especially during this pandemic. It was unadvisable for a lot of people to, to go to church, but, but still they could go to church on Zoom. They're still getting up and going to church. And uh, for most people at most times, it is crucial to do that. This is the pattern of true worship. We go to him to thank him and to praise him. And then one more element of worship is last on the list, but only because it should go without saying, and yet it needs to be said, and that is the person. Verse 5 focuses on the person who is the object of our worship. We go to church to worship God. Maybe the most simplistic statement I've ever made from this pulpit. We go to church to worship God, but still, we got to say that. Is that why most people go to church? There are a host of other reasons why people go to church. And there are just as many reasons why people choose not to go to church. But if the reason that we go to church is to worship God, then I can't think of a single reason why anyone who says they're a believer in Jesus Christ would not go, except that it's physically impossible to get there. You might not like the preacher. You may be mad at somebody at church. You may not like some decision that was made. You might have some other things that honestly you'd rather be doing. But if you believe that the Lord is good, which he is, then you'll go to church to worship him. If you know that he has been merciful to you, a sinner, which he has, then you'll go to church to worship him. If you have found God to be faithful and true and unfailing, always there when you need him, which he is, then you will be there for him when it's time to worship him. Now, I know the ones who really need to hear this the most are the ones who aren't here, but uh, I want those of you who are here today to affirm your commitment to worship the Lord, to be committed to praising God, to come before him with joyful singing, to be a part of his people, not some independent sheep wandering in some other pasture, to be consistent in the pattern of going to God to worship and to praise and to thank him. And to remember that it is the person of God, of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit that we are worshiping. 
And then our worship will be, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. And even if there's only two people here, we will know that we are his creatures who are here to worship our God and King.